Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Secret Resume Podcast, hosted by me, Melody Moore. In this podcast, we explore the people, places, and experiences that have shaped my guests, those which have influenced who they are as people and where they are in their work life today. You can listen in as we have a rich exploration of often unexamined and undiscussed, but very important aspects of their lives, or as I like to call it, their secret resume. My guest today is Ian Dinwiddie. Ian is a coach, mentor, and the founder of Inspiring Dads. He delivers coaching presentations and workshops to innovative businesses who put supporting new dads at the heart of their gender equality strategy, recognizing the positive impact on equality and well-being of helping dads solve the challenge of how to be a great dad without sacrificing a great career. An ex-management consultant, twice a stay-at-home dad, and an English National League hockey umpire. He was the co-host of 46 episodes of the Lockdown Dads podcast, where they interviewed politicians, PhDs, and an international rock star. He's married to Lisa, a lawyer at Simmons & Simmons, and they have two children, a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son. So, welcome in. It's really fabulous to have you here today. I'm very excited Uh, to talk a bit more about you and your life and your story. Thanks, Melody. Um, Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, So, you know, my name's Ian Dinwiddie. I'm the founder of a business called Inspiring Dads. And we very much focus on supporting dads through the parental transition when they first become fathers in those early, heady days of fatherhood. Not necessarily just the first time, but every time they become a dad. And when we We sort of reevaluate what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father and what it means for our relationships and our focus at work and the opportunities to be maybe the dad we don't necessarily remember growing up. So I get an enormous amount of pleasure out of that. And I look forward to talking about and talking about my story and talking about a little bit about how I help dads and what elements I think are really important for men to think about. Brilliant. And I reached out to you, Ian, because I think that one of the absolute key aspects of helping women be more successful at work and uh, really, uh, you know, release their potential is the role that uh, their partners and fathers of their children play. So I think what you're doing is really important. So very happy to speak to you. So let's um, let's start at the beginning, shall we, in terms of your childhood and some of the things that influenced your views on um, and on men and what are typically male and female things to be doing. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Somerset in, in Taunton. And so a lot of sort of my sort of early childhood revolved around what I sometimes call the three C's. There was uh, there were cows, there were cricket, and to a certain extent, maybe not when I was uh, very young, but there certainly was cider as well. So there were three C's. <laughs> but also in, in our experience, in our family, there was also the car phone. So my dad was a chartered surveyor, actually chartered surveyor. There's a, there's a fifth C in there as well. My dad was a chartered surveyor. And so he um, he used to travel around Somerset into Devon, a bit of Avon, that kind of uh, that kind of thing. And he he would value houses. And what he he had back when Car Phone Warehouse was kind of the obvious name for a shop that sold car phones, uh, not necessarily mobile phones were, uh, were were a long way away. He had this this massive kind of brick that was attached to it, you know, in behind in the middle of the car. And what it meant, he could be really really flexible in a way that men women just couldn't be because the technology just didn't really exist however he could he could schedule his his, his visits his, his house visits um and he could fit around seeing my brother and I play sports and we were often playing sport on a Wednesday afternoon we'd be in various parts sort of locally and frequently here there was another dad as well actually who turned up and I think he'd made a lot of money in some kind of property investing uh, empire that he had going on but dad well dad wasn't in that kind of scale but what he did have was flexibility and so he was able to, he had, he had his dictaphone, he was able to record things and, and drop that off in the office the next day. But he had this amazing degree of flexibility in terms of where he knew where he was going to work, but he could also schedule to be be there and be present and kind of support us. I guess in some ways, it's kind of a stereotype stereotypically sort of masculine thing where he was a dad supporting his sons doing sport. And in that sense, it's not not that uncommon to what, you know, what I do now with with um, with Struan and also with Freya and her sport as well. But at the time, that degree of flexibility wasn't something that many, many people had in to any degree, I don't think. 
And um, there were other things that happened in your childhood, weren't there, that kind of, I guess, that maybe it didn't feel like it challenged um, your stereotypes because maybe you didn't have them. I don't know. But it's, uh, you know, there was certain things that happened that meant that typical male and female roles um, or stereotypical male and female roles kind of fell away. Yeah, that's right. I think you get very used to, uh, I guess, processing and understanding your own backstory. And you take it almost for granted that things were how they were. And, and like you say, so dad was, dad was working flexibly when I was sort of in, in my you know, first 10 years of my life or so. And then when I was about 11 years old, our mum was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And she'd been struggling with some of the symptoms for, for a while. There were various sort of thoughts and theories on it. And actually, she got worse quite quickly. So there weren't any, you know, they've made massive um, strides in sort of medical uh, medical advancements in terms of how they treat multiple sclerosis. But whereas um, for a lot of people, there's this kind of cycle of remission and and uh, you know and, and then regression. The mum just largely had regression. So very very quickly, she was using a wheelchair, you know, almost exclusively from the age of about 13. When I was about when I was about 13, she was she would have been. She was 40 when she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And so quite quickly we had to work out where are we going to live. Um, we moved from a, a sort of you know four-bedroom semi-detached house into a bungalow. And that was that was quite challenging. Looking for a family bungalow was actually mm. quite an interesting process for my parents in particular. But domestically, we didn't have we didn't have sort of uh, male and female jobs. We didn't have mums sort of picking up af- after us, which maybe you know for a lot of my friends, teenage teenage friends, teenage boys, and that would be kind of that was almost the default. It was the eighties, and mums tend to stay at home, and dads were out to work. Actually, mum was at home, but she also there was only a fight. There was a relatively small amount of things that she could do physically, emotionally, and so that emotional support was always still there. But domestically, then it was a case of, um, you know, one of us would wash up, one of us would do the dishes, we'd be, you know, the vacuuming, the cleaning was was all divvied out, we'd, we'd be very, very hands on um, from, I guess, what, you know, a relatively early age and certainly through our teenage years, um, I got very... I got very aware of um, parking restrictions, got very aware of where drop curbs were and how, you know, how important it was for curb you know, to be able to manoeuvre a wheelchair over curbs and that sort of thing. And I still to this day will not, it doesn't matter under any circumstances, I will never park in a disabled parking space, mm-hmm. even at venues where there are hundreds of, I see go to lots of places um, where you know, we know that there are, they, they don't need, you know, we know that those spaces aren't needed for this particular time. But uh, it's one of my, one of my rules, I guess, is I will never, never park in them, never use them. And uh, it does, yeah, I get, I get used to, I get used to seeing people who don't necessarily follow that. So, I, you know, I have to, it's one of those things I have to let go. But certainly, certainly at home, it was, it was all about, it was all about men mucking in and doing domestic labour. Mm. It's interesting what you say about the drop curbs and um, parking spaces and things. I crossed uh, London just recently uh, with, uh, and I had my dog and a suitcase with me. Um, And normally we take a route that doesn't require using the underground, but for various reasons I ended up having to. And I was just really angry the whole time. Not for me. But thinking if I, you know, there was people with prams who were struggling, struggling similarly, you know, the the lack of um, lift access on our underground network is shocking. You know, Euston Station, you can't get from the tube um, up to uh, certain levels. Uh, I think the final bit has got a lift, but the initial bit has no lift. So you have to go on an escalator. And I thought that's one of the major um routes to the north of england Mm. from london and you can't uh easily access and i just it really i was so cross the whole time thinking about people who have disabilities who you know are not able to to get around as easily as we normally can and thinking how um how restricted people's access is um and it's it just made me really cross I bet I bet I think it, certainly when when I was you know it was hands-on experiencing that then I was much much more aware than I am now I mean mum hasn't been with us for a number of years now um so you don't really 
so I'm not as close to the detail. But yeah, once you once you see these things and experience them, you know, I think you can't. You, it, it really it really strikes you and it really catches mm. you. I think. So, yeah. mm. I'm curious when you were a child then and you were taking on uh, you uh, and uh, was it a brother you had? Did you say? Yes. Yeah. I've still, I still still do have a brother. Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> another <laughs> talking about him in the past scene. tense. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. Chris. Chris is uh, say he is 16 months younger than me, so uh-huh. we're pretty yeah. close in age. Yeah. So the the boys in your family, you the two of you and your dad taking on more of what and you know uh i had an upbringing at a similar amount of time it definitely stereotypically would have been female jobs i don't think it's changed that much if i'm honest in terms of those stereotypically mm. female jobs so we can talk more about that but i'm curious whether you were aware of the fact that it was different for you than it was for your friends um i think yes i mean Yes, I did. I think one of the things that I was quite conscious of, I think we was, was I guess when it came to holidays and things like that in particular. So holidays involved a different type of logistics. We could only stay in particular places that were wheelchair friendly, for instance. I remember, I certainly remember sort of before that, I don't remember, we, we never really went on foreign holidays particularly. I have a, you know, I have a lot of knowledge about various uh, various parts of the UK, which I then try <laughs> and take the kids on the same sort of journey. And actually, I really enjoy like, you know, visiting parts of the UK. And when I was a when I was you know, a young boy, it's kind of, well, why can't we go on a hot, sunny kind of holiday? And certainly, whereas mum was more disabled than it was about, um, it was about accessing the right kind of accommodation. So that obviously felt very different. Um, I was, I would say, yeah, I was the only, I was the only boy, but Chris and I were the only, probably the only, I don't remember any other parents at school who were disabled, or not obviously so anyway. Mm -hmm. So we're the the only ones with, you know, the access had to be different if you need to get to the hall at school, or if you had a performance, then you had to go around the other way, and there was always that kind of element. Um, So yes, yes, aware. but then, you know, my mum was a really, really good host in the sense that everyone was welcome round. So there was a, we used to, we used to go out on a Thursday night uh, to a nightclub that was quite relatively close to where we lived. And then we'd all, we'd either get a taxi or we'd walk back. So we'd have, in the morning, we'd have, because we it was a big bungalow and we were all on one level, we'd come show ourselves off and there'd be sort of five hungover teenagers <laughs> in sleeping bags um, all over her living room floor and mum was always very good at that sort of side of things and I think I don't remember particularly it was just it just was how it was in a way I don't know it's um yeah it, 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 it was just it was just part of I guess part of part of life and you know but I think it, I think it helps that mum was, although she was physically disabled, she wasn't mentally disabled. Mm-hmm. And, and so you, you know, my friends would, you know, would always have a chat with mum, and she would always, uh, she she would dob me in, or people would uh, people would tell <laughs> stories about me and stuff. And it, but, but it was it was in that sense, it was the same kind of relationship which I had with their parents. Mm-hmm. So yeah, different in terms of what what was possible to do, mm. and, and sort of holidays, I guess, in particular. But uh, from a sort of emotional side actually kind of similar I mean it was yeah challenging much more challenging for dad I think in many ways yeah in what way I I, I think the caring responsibility um certainly uh that became harder over time uh, mum ended up living in a home sort of with sort of full-time care so that was that was challenging so I think that element of becoming I mean we go through these cycles here we and you talk about we talk about these sort of transitions and and quite aware of kind of sandwich generation where you're sandwiched between looking after young children but also looking after elderly relatives for dad he was you know we were we were a, we didn't need looking after because we got to that sort of age where we were you know fairly independent and could be released out into the wild as it were um and uh, but he was then had this responsibility um to sort of care for mum but also obviously getting support and paying for support and that side of things so you have these kind of it's not I guess when you get married it's not necessarily a thing that you think about it's okay how you know at some stage you might have to care for each other but it came a lot earlier for mum and dad than it would have done for in, in a lot of relationships and that that comes with pressure and challenge it's not it's not necessarily the the journey that you would have expected to be on so yeah 
under yeah. pressure. No, I can imagine. So speaking of you being released out into the wild, um, <laughs> that's your uh, next transition that we uh, again talk about, you know, that kind of university and then post-university and, and what that felt like. Do you want to share a bit about that? Yeah, so I grew up, like I said, grew up in Somerset. Um, you know, a trip to Bristol was a big was a big deal. <laughs> we never went to Yeovil. I don't remember as a kid particularly going to Exeter. You know, Taunton was kind of this this kind of hub of hub of Somerset, and certainly sort of relatively uh, kind of relatively big. It was a big town with a you know in, in a rural area, so it attracted lots of people. And Saturday night was always a, was was always a big night out. People would travel from a long way away, so it felt it felt like the centre of something. Um, and then I, I had an opportunity to go away. I went to I went to live, uh, live and work in a school in Australia for a year, so uh, nine months. So I went to Canberra Grammar School. That's another C, actually. The C's are all keep flowing here. So Canberra Grammar School. It was a connection through um, my French teacher, and he knew a te- he knew someone over there, and and I spent spent a period of time, kind of sort of on uh on, on what would be lower way lower than minimum wage but accommodation and food was thrown in and having a great time over there and then very much a very different transition so I went to the University of London I uh, went to University College London and that sort of move from uh you know it's from a from a rural market town as it still was then it's a little bit it feels a little bit different now but certainly where farming was central you know Cricket is still very much central to sort of Taunton's identity in Somerset in particular, but into, I remember very vividly uh, visiting London and walking down, walking down from UCL, I had an interview at UCL, an interview at King's, walking down, I went onto the Mall, and I looked one way and I could see Buckingham Palace, I looked the other way and I could see Trafalgar Square. It's like, if I get the chance to come, I need to come. You know, you don't get this all the time. Actually, a lot of friends ended up moving to London later on, but I had the, I had the opportunity to go to, go to um, University in London and made a lot of friends, uh, played a lot of hockey, and still have lots of friends that I still stay in touch with, certainly on the hockey side of things. And uh moved away a little bit, but very much, I guess in many ways consider consider, I guess I do consider London to be home. I have these two homes. They're very, very culturally in many ways, I feel very connected to Somerset, but in a way that I almost almost kind of outgrew it, I guess, over time. And so going back is quite a strange, sort of almost bittersweet experience. And I think I'm very much uh, feeling much more like a Londoner in many ways, or an outer Londoner, London borough of Bromley. We're not really, you know, it used to be Kent back in the day. <laughs> My family still always tell people I live in London and I'm like, I don't, I live in Surrey. <laughs> <laughs> It's an important def- it's an important distinction to make. Is. I I can't <laughs> vote in the um London mayor elections. Yes, you see I very I... much can. So I'm very much we are very much in London. So um yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we're just outside the M25, so we don't count. Yeah. So it's a very important distinction to me. Not clearly <laughs> not to my family who live up north, and it's all just yeah. down south to them. <laughs> it's all smoke, it's all it's all southeast. <laughs> yeah, it's just... I, I bet, yeah. yeah yeah and you you said earlier when we were talking about you know that kind of shift when you left university that sort of sort of being carefree and you know all the good things that being a student brings you know then there's a shift into what did you call it pseudo adulthood I think yes <laughs> I, I think pseudo adulthood I I um I guess there's little fact, there's, there's little moments in time that you kind of remember. And one of them actually going back a little bit. I remember being 17 and I was playing cricket and I was watching the cricket match. I was sitting on the side. I, I guess I'd either I'd either batted or I, I think I batted or I don't know. I was sitting there watching watching other people play. And there was this little boy and he was maybe maybe seven years old. And he's he was sitting on the bench and oh that's so he was I, know, I guess he's watching his dad. And he said, uh, he asked me this strange question. It's something stuck in your mind he said um are you a man <laughs> I was like I was like I was 17 or so I was like I think so he said how old are you I said 17 he said you're not a man and I was just like wow <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and it's it was, it was kind of this really <laughs> profound moment and so that kind of obviously predates university and I think it's this sense of I think sort of being a man or masculinity. So it's a transition. It's, there are stages and phases and they they flow together. 
But later on, when I was uh, I was when I played hockey, we used to go on a hockey tour, and we were away in Spain. And towards the end of the tour, someone had some sun in, and they were spraying. You know, people who want the sun in their hair were by the pool in this, you know, making a lot of noise, taking over. The director Mar it was, um, and he was. We were taking over, taking over the pool, and probably we were probably blissfully unaware at how much we're just annoying, uh, annoying <laughs> yeah, everyone else, things, <laughs> everything else. Yeah, we're just loud and obnoxious. Probably, I don't know. I hate to think. Um, and uh, I had some sun in my hair, and I suddenly realised my hair was. Uh, you can't really tell on the uh, obviously on the podcast, but my hair was a lot darker at the time. And I suddenly thought, and I had sun in my hair, and I suddenly thought, hang on. An interview. I'm interviewing for W. H. Smiths in like a week's time. It was graduate graduate program. Had this opportunity to talk to them about it and go, go and see them. And I was suddenly like, what if I have a streak of blonde? That I, that I can't have that. So I die. I remember diving in the pool and washing it off and going, okay. Well, that was a close strong thing. And it was this moment where actually, up until then, it almost didn't matter in many ways. Now I haven't got any tattoos. I didn't do anything particularly um particularly illegal I guess in many ways and I didn't have anything I didn't have a sort of backstory that was particularly edgy at all but there was a moment where I was like oh well actually pseudo adulthood I, like I, when we were talking before I was talking about sort of pseudo adulthood because I think actually there you flow it you move into it so I then then later on became a graduate trainee for W. H. Smith group but I was um I was what 21 22 maybe um in comparison to people I was working with, I was much younger, people I was managing, uh, people I was working for. And you, I think there's stages of life where depending on who you meet and, and how old they are, you feel like you're maybe, you know, you're a little bit of a big fish in a small pool. You feel older and wiser than perhaps actually you are. And it's not to say that you don't know things. Perhaps you don't know as much or you perhaps don't have as much life experience as, um, as you perhaps think you do. Um, and sometimes you catch it with the kids and you know I was last night I was helping out with cubs uh, and my son was doing cubs and we were doing a walk and and this boy we were talking about a few things talking about rings on the trees and things like that and moss and whether which side of the tree the moss often grows and things like that and, and so the boy said you know a lot of things I said well I'm a bit older <laughs> you know you'll know a lot of things as well and maybe you'll remember this conversation but it was quite strange. We we're talking about dock leave. So someone had um they stunned themselves. And so we were looking for a dock leaf and explaining about dock leaves grow near and this is what it is. And and it's the stinging is a little bit of poison on the surface. And for some reason, dock leaves are like nature. Well, uh, well we assume, you know, we always we grow up with dock leaves and stinging. Whether, I think I read that that's, that's actually, not that actually true. true. I don't know. No, I think I read true? recently it's not true. So you've actually been lying to cubs. <laughs> I mean, there are as crimes go. That is pretty much. That's that is pretty a bad. bad. Crime, isn't it? Yeah, it is pretty bad. It no, it was bad. only recently I read that actually that they said that dock leaves don't work, and it reminds me of a time. I don't know how old I was. This should come out with a parent advisory. So anyone listening to this, turn it down now. <laughs> Your children have not heard this. <laughs> yeah. It's a good theory, though, isn't it? And if it yeah. makes them feel better, there's probably a placebo effect. So even if it's Must not be. true, yeah, yeah. Then small child would believe I, it. I, I'm still going to run with it. Yeah, me too. Um, but I remember saying to my dad, um, who was a teacher, and he did know a lot. Um, I remember he didn't know the answer to something. And I said to him, but you know everything. Why don't you know? And he thought I was being rude to him. I was being honest. I thought he knew everything. And he was really angry because he thought I was basically taking the mickey. Um, and I wasn't at all. And I still don't think that he believed me. But I remember being feeling really outraged because he was angry with me when I was just saying what I thought was the truth. Um, but yeah, I believed my dad knew everything. To be fair, I think he wanted to believe he knew everything. So <laughs> yes, there, is a, there is a fine line. I think um, my son in particular, I've talked to other dads. Um, so uh, my son plays, plays some cricket. He's quite early. He's been playing cricket for a couple of years. And I, I used to play. And I, I, know, yeah, I know things about how to play and all the rest of it. But I was talking to another dad who's a, who's, who's a coach. And we were sort of musing the fact that if we say something and we do a little tip and say, well, try this and that, you'll find this easier. 
they'd ignore us. But then we were watching, he said, I think the coach has just picked him up on the thing that I said. So after we went downstairs, he said, uh, Harrison, um, did the coach say about moving your feet in that way? He said, yes. Did, is that something I said the other day? He's like, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe I know a little bit. He's like, mm. <laughs> it's very much, and it's very much the same as Struan, and it's that um, they don't necessarily, sometimes, you know, it's nice that they, uh, nice that they think you know everything, but also at the same time, sometimes they, uh, they don't believe in you know everything either. After that uh, pseudo adulthood, I can't even say it now, pseudo adulthood <laughs> transition, um, there was perhaps more of a, a, a significant adulthood transition when your first child was born. Um, that probably feels a lot less like pseudo adulthood uh, when that happens. Uh, but do you want to tell us a bit about that and your sort of caring arrangements and everything that you mm. uh, sorted out for your first and second child? Yeah, so um, Lisa and I met in, I think uh, it must be, she should probably know, shouldn't I, in, in advance. Uh, Lisa and I met in 2004, I think it was, and we got married in uh, 2008. Mm. And um, Freya was born in January 2010. And so, but, but before, before Freya was born, we, we had to have some quite sort of practical conversations, quite sort of, well, I guess, philosophical conversations as a couple as to how we were going to be parents. What were going to be the mechanics around, um, you know, around who was going to look after her at what stage? How, what would that look and feel like? Conversations that, you know, that couples are having all the time. But we had this sort of, we had, I guess we had two overlays. One was that we didn't have any grandparents around. So we had we had that. So my in-laws live in the Channel Islands. My my dad, um, my mum had, my mum died just before, you know, a few months before Freya was born. Dad was in Somerset. We were in London. We didn't have kind of uh, sort of family set up around us. I was working as a management consultant at the time. And so um, sort of really interesting work, but not being paid as well as, Lisa was being paid and Lisa's, Lisa's a lawyer. And so we had conversations about, okay, how does this work? I, I took my, my two weeks of leave. I actually naively, and I, looking back, it seems absurd, really. I actually thought the two weeks of her paternity leave would be fully paid. It was only when I got my pay slip was I realised that statutory pay, and it's just like, you clearly like, well, statutory paternity leave doesn't pay. You know, we're, what, you know, what does that mean? I mean, I don't think, I didn't obviously join the dots until much later on, but at the time it was like, hang on, they've missed, they haven't paid me the right amount. It was literally that kind of, that kind of sense. Lisa, of course, working in a law firm, she had six months of fully paid maternity. But then we had to, we had to work out, so predating Freya's birth, we had to work out how it was going to work. Consultancy was working away from home. Uh, Lisa was getting paid more than I was. We had a gender pay gap when we first met. Um, I think in some, and I know there's lots of research that suggests that men struggle where the dynamic changes within the relationships in terms of breadwinning um, sort of capacity, and where men who have started a relationship where they've earned more than women or, or, or earned more than their female partner if they're in a heterosexual relationship, then struggle when the when things are reversed the other way around. It's really really interesting research about male ego and that sort of thing. We didn't have that, so from a practical basis. It made sense for Lisa to take her leave and for Lisa to carry on working. Law is much more of a straight line kind of conventional career. Consultancy, you could freelance. I was pretty confident there was opportunities to freelance and it kind of made sense. And so um, we had a kind of, I guess we had a sort of two week sort of handover. I actually worked four days a week when Freya was first born. So I reduced it and we had this all planned out. So two, three months before Freya was born, I already knew the date which I would, assuming everything went well, I already knew the date and so did the business of which day I'd be leaving and finishing, that's it, done. Um, I also had already planned that it was going to be four days a week. Uh, I could be flexible on what those four days were around business need because, you know, it was it was there to, you know, to build these bonds and to have more time together. So you, we had that kind of little bit of financial hit um, in terms of what I was earning. And then I stopped work and we became a, you know, we became a single income sort of relationship. And that income was built around, was, was entirely built around Lisa's, uh, Lisa's law career. 
And can so I ask? Next, can, mm. I just got this is just loads. It's making me think of loads of questions. But you mentioned um, the fact that you had a she was earning more than you when you met. Yes. Um, and you also talked about ego and men's mm. ego around earning. And I'm curious um, to understand how you felt about that. And you know the, the I guess the the how your ego has felt through throughout this this time. Mm. Yeah, I. Yeah, it's. It's interesting. It for me, it was less about ego and more about, uh, yes, identity in many ways. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I happened to meet and fall in love with someone who was a lawyer, who earned good money and probably would do, if you carried on working, would earn more money. Um, that was just one of those quirks of just who you meet, and I. I was, I'll say what I was going to say. I had met a lot of women um, beforehand who would potentially could have been, I could have been in a relationship with, or I could have been, it could have been a, a person I married. So there were, there were, there was, that sounds ridiculous. Isn't it? There, there were other relate. there were other All these women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, well, there weren't that many, but there were enough. Um, but, but all these relationships, any one of them, and, and there were several that you think, well, why didn't that one work out? It just, it was what it was. Mm. And so it wasn't it wasn't by design that we ended up in this sort of circumstance, I guess. So I was just quite, I don't know, I just, when you meet someone who earns more than you do, and that's not really why you're together, and it's just part, it's just a feature of the relationship. I didn't really ever think about it. For me, it was so it was less about ego, it was more about identity. So when I first started looking after Freya, she was six months old, sort of full time. So Lisa was at work. Monday to Friday, wasn't working from home because, hey, who worked from home pre-2021 uh, you know, or so, um, 2020 and uh, 2020. Um, and so it was, it was Freya and I, it was, it was us making our own kind of time and she wasn't in nursery until, until nine months. She was 16 months old when she went to nursery. So I had nine months where it was, it was looking after her, which was amazing. It did very much the same kind of pattern with Struan. And um, and so I remember people saying, well, what do you do? You know, this is the classic conversation. What do you do? Oh, I'm a management consultant. I remember certainly answering, oh, I'm, a, I'm a management consultant, which comes with it, you know, as, as you know, it comes with loaded connotations in terms of, you know, giving your watch and telling your time and all these kind of <laughs> yeah. things and, and sacking people, which actually was almost never happened in the sort of stuff I did. Um, but I wasn't clearly. I, I wasn't. I was. Um, I was a full time full time carer for for a, for a little girl who you know had reflux, and so I was. You know, we were managing managing that, and you know, trying to help her to walk, and she was very very slow at learning to walk, and that was kind of the, a feature of feature of that. So I had that kind of. I had this work identity being taken away, but actually it was funny because I wasn't that bothered about being a consultant particularly. I was never that ambitious. It didn't have, it wasn't a straight line for me. I'd, I'd worked for WH Smith. I'd worked in publishing for Hodder and Stoughton for three and a half years. I wanted to test myself in some kind of consultancy environment because if you went to UCL or you went to any of those top tier universities in the 90s, a lot of people went into consultancy, lots of friends. You know, you looked on LinkedIn, there were lots of people doing important work in inverted commas and they were traveling and doing, well, I kind of thought, oh, I wanted a bit of that. I actually ended up working in food manufacturing a lot of the time, which is not that glamorous, but nor even is, um, you know, endless international travel to places you don't really want to be. So there are, you know, it, it swings and roundabouts. Um, so I had that, that identity piece was quite a struggle. What I was quite fortunate with at the time was I had the opportunity to develop my hockey umpiring career. And so I was I was umpiring every Saturday. And so that would be my time. Having looked after Freya during the week, my time was to go away and to do that and to focus on that and have that as a kind of um, a little bit of a status piece. Uh, and after a number of years, Freya would have been about five, Struan would have been two when I became a National League hockey umpire. So it's a level three umpire in, in, uh, in, sort of in the English structure. Um, but building up to that, you have a certain degree of, 
authority so you'd have the shirt and you know, i have a shirt with a name my surname on the back and all those kind of little bits and pieces and i think in some ways that sense of um that sense of status maybe mm -hmm. identity i was i was a I, I wasn't uh you know i wasn't an umpire and a you know a consultant i was a dad and an umpire and actually i was high enough up that it meant something a little bit more and sometimes you meet people who played hockey and they go oh you're a proper umpire or oh you umpire up there mm. it's like well I do but it doesn't feel that different but actually there is a little bit of kudos around it it's not that much kudos I mean <laughs> ultimately you're still a match official uh in, in sport um it's not it's not like you're you might be you know you might be helping elite players to play the game but you're not the elite player yourself you're just a facilitator so I think it was yeah identity I think identity more than ego I mean you get a lot of casual banter under the thumb is your wife paying this evening you, do you want to check if you're allowed if you're allowed to buy around all that kind of you know friendly kind of friendly sort of stuff that for someone who perhaps was feeling a bit vulnerable in a male conversation male conversation maybe would find that quite challenging or find that they were feeling less of you know less of a man in inverted commas maybe it could be quite challenging that kind of casual banter that men indulge in can some men will find it more difficult to brush off or to absorb, observe, absorb, uh, you know, a, a kind of you know, sort of absorb it and just sort of move on with it. And I think, you know, we do, language does matter. It didn't matter to me because I guess I was quite relatively, relatively early in that sort of solo care of Freya and then Monday to Friday anyway, solo care. Um, then I got quite relaxed about, you know, this is, this is who, it, this is how it was at the moment. But then it was brilliant when I did do some work. Yeah, I find that really interesting. The sort of the hockey umpiring giving you that sense of, uh, like you say, status or another identity. I suppose I it's something I observe with mums who uh, who stop working is often they lose that sense of other identities and it all becomes very enmeshed. So there's something very interesting about how we enmesh our identities with our work, for instance. I remember yeah. a senior colleague of mine years and years ago saying to me, because I'm a psychologist by training, business psychologist, and I remember saying to me, you know, that she'd stopped using the term psychologist when she introduced herself and now just called herself a consultant. And I remember thinking, gosh, I can't imagine that. But actually, multiple years later, exactly the same, I hardly ever you know use that term now my mm -hmm. identity's changed and i'm less attached to to certain things so I, I think that's really interesting how we identify but the other thing it made me think about was um the mums how are the mums how are the mums um i think the mums are doing just fine they were i went to a lot of um sort of baby and parent groups let's call them baby and parent groups for uh, sake of argument because that's actually what they are they they may be branded in different ways uh i was quite um i wasn't too worried about being the only man which i often was i'd been the only man in a sales team in publishing at hodder and stout and there were 14 of us i was the only man in in that department there were there were other men of my kind of age who sat nearby or in different departments but that was kind of that was the dynamic within that organization. I'd always had quite a lot of female friends. I was quite, I was very comfortable talking to women. But what I did find that I, I didn't, I didn't really think about those kind of group dynamics, but I, I also used to go to a dad's group in, in Wimbledon. So the other side of South London, and I had a friend who was a police officer, a couple of friends actually um, who were police officers and their shift patterns often coincided. So I used to go and I still see Andy to this day and uh, Andy and his, his daughter was very similar aged Freya. And so Andy and I used to meet up and then um, in the morning, and then I would go and then I'd go on to this dad's group. And this dad's group was really, really interesting dynamics because there were men there. They ran it twice a week. I only went once a week because it was a bit of a trap. There were dads there for whom those, those two days were core to their week. They weren't interacting with other groups. They weren't comfortable in female dominated spaces. For, for whatever reason and certainly in my coaching experience I've spoken to men who haven't haven't felt comfortable engaging because of the kind of will I be a threat am I welcome here 
you know, is my masculinity actually, you know, a hindrance? Will anyone talk to me? And so there were many, it was quite, it was actually quite sad to see. There were men for whom, you know, the other two days, you know, Monday, Monday and Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, they would be out doing solo things and they would be walk, they would be walking in the park and they would only the only person they might speak to during the day was their was their was their baby, their toddler. Um, whereas I I had these interactions with other people. And you, you kind of, I always think it's important that you you go out once a day for something. And it can get quite expensive, lots of obviously free stuff that you can do. But I was quite relaxed about the interactions with in female dominated environments. I didn't didn't mind. I used to kind of I used to quite enjoy them because I used to see the cliques that were there. And so they would always they were so people wouldn't some people would talk to me. I wasn't part of anyone's clique particularly, but there were there were women who wouldn't talk to each other, who didn't ever talk to each other because they didn't already know each other. So they would come as a three and they'd leave as a three. So in monkey music, he used to um there was this like there was a the monkey music was great fun. So you'd sit there and there was you know, there were various songs and there was this kind of soft pink monkey that would dance around and you'd sing songs about where was he hiding and you do it was all real rhyme and time kind of, kind of aspects and everyone would sit it's in a whole sort of semicircle on the floor and then but if you let it if you if you let it go everyone would sit in the same place every time so I used to deliberately move if I was in early if I was first one in I would sit in a different place and I'd go for a week I'd sit in a different place every week to distort the dynamic and make people think about interacting with different people I did it very deliberately it's perhaps a little bit weird um but I had a, kind of had a lot of fun with, with moving around and saying okay if I sit here I might get to talk to this person who I never get to talk to unless I sit here so I was kind of I was playing around and having a little bit of fun I guess in that sense but yeah so I was quite happy you know I, I m- mum's groups as they were you know yeah, yeah practically they are was was fine for me but there were certainly lots of men I met for whom it was um, it was a challenge on different levels. Mm-hmm. If you could give advice to mums in those groups about men being in the groups, what what advice would you give them? Um, talk to them like a normal person. Just say hello and have a conversation. There, I think men worry that if they initiate the conversation, they'll be seen as hitting on the women. They'll be mm-hmm. seen as, um, a, and actually, we know they're not. But sometimes it takes, I think it takes the mum to start the conversation to make it okay for the dad to then have the conversation. And then actually the majority of conversations in those environments are fairly uh, fairly low-key and practical about looking after children and teething and... Nappies and poo. Nappies and <laughs> borrowing nappies because you've forgotten. You only do that. Well, you only really, I only did that once. Um, you know, uh, it's that kind of nature. But I think... You will find some of those men in those environments will be very happy to be there and perhaps they're quite chatty and some of them it's it's a dynamic they didn't necessarily choose and they're quite uncomfortable so I think initiating the conversation and saying it's okay we're parents it's not this it's not mums in this corner and the dad who no one talks to because you know it's a man we haven't we don't see men during the day here there's starting those conversations I think it's really important Mm. it makes it it makes it okay for the man to just kind of have a parenting conversation which is actually really what he wants to do he wants to talk to other yeah. parents and have a moan about sleep patterns and you know, <laughs> how exhausted and these, you are all, yeah. all these things yeah because yeah. he's, yeah. he's you have more in common than uh than the gender difference which is mm. the more obvious difference but you've got a lot more in common i think in those groups than, yeah than yeah that's interesting right focusing on what you've got in common and the similarities yeah i think that's mm. interesting good advice okay let's move on to um another uh period in your life which wasn't long after in 2012 where you know you had some very bad news about someone you knew yeah so um it was i still remember i still got the email actually i read it back so a friend, a friend of mine from the university called dan he was living in south wales and dan sent this email around to a number of us who who were who were good hockey friends and he said i've just been sent this this email about a charity cycle ride and it it appears to be Paul. It appears to be Paul Burke. It's our friend, our friend Berkey from university. He, he his son died and he died. And it was just um then we kind of explored a little bit of the backstory and learned a bit more. And so what had happened was that George, who was one year old, had suddenly become ill and fitted and 
they couldn't save him. They took him to hospital, but the, the doctors couldn't save him. And Rian and Paul were sort of dispatched out into the night with his belongings and no support and no sort of aftercare and no sort of thought of actually how are these individuals going to cope. And in Paul's case, he he didn't cope. And Rian tells a story of um, how he sort of blamed himself and how, as a dad, he should have done more. He could have, could have done more. What, what did he not do? Feeling very, very responsible. And, and tragically, he took his own life five days later. And um, and very much the catalyst for Rian. So Rian Manning's um, OBE, uh, OBE, MBE, MBE. <laughs> Give me the wrong designation. So she formed that she she um, created a charity called To Wish. They work all across Wales, supporting parents who have children who have suddenly died under twenty five, who so suddenly died, and supporting the parents when their children um, and when they become bereaved, um, because it's a support that Paul, she and Paul didn't have. And she she strongly believes that had that support been in place in some form, whether it was talking, whether it was they do a lot of work with memory boxes and taking uh, you know taking imprints of, of of the baby's you know baby's feet, or they've got I think in all the hospitals they've got a they've got a, they've got a room uh, paid for by the charity, so that you can go there if you're a bereaved parent, you can you can have some space and time, and it was. I guess it was really, really striking as a as a young dad myself or a new dad myself. So Freya was only a couple of years old. Was that that kind of certainty that things would be okay? Actually, things might not be okay, and it was really, really, really important to have support. And also, I guess ultimately, when I started thinking about um, coaching, is that men getting comfortable with being vulnerable and accessing help when they needed it. Um, and that's the kind of that sort of general theme is something I think that's really really important. Um, and so Paul's, uh, you know, Paul's legacy is there through through the charity Paul and George and, and to wish and uh, yeah, Rian's done some amazing amazing things in terms of developing that charity and leading it. And I vividly, I think I probably met her back as so Paul was a university friend, but he was also a friend from Somerset. So we went to different schools, same same sort of age. And you're apart different schools. So I might have met her before previously on a on a night out such as you do. Um, but I remember very vividly meeting her and uh, the first time and it and it, and it became a hockey thing because Paul was a hockey friend. I went, there was a charity hockey match in his old school, his old school friends against the school. And I I went and umpired. I made sure I you know, I, I said, Can I can I can't do that? And then it's become that and we do an annual annual match that we um we do that we we remember him, we also remember a number a couple of other friends from the university, a couple of other men that we've lost since then. Um, and so I think it was really as a I think as a young, as a young new dad, it was really, really striking this I, you know, that you would lose your child. You're not supposed to lose your child. You're supposed, certainly it doesn't happen, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it was very, very common. We're not, we're not used to that. It's not supposed to happen. And I think um, but when the worst comes to the worst, and regardless of whether it's bereavement or whether it's you know redundancy or whatever it might be, things that put us under pressure, men having the the skills or the wherewithal or the comfort to say actually it's okay to be vulnerable, it's okay to talk about things, not to bottle it up. I think it's the bottling up, which in terms of men's mental health, that can be quite challenging. You know, in, in my own sort of you know own coaching in terms of parental transition. And we know that you know ten percent of men have become depressed during their partner's pregnancy, and first year of, of fatherhood, I think it's twice the rate of depression amongst new dads is twice that of the general male population, and so it's quite it's really important time to support men and, and generally. So, so yeah, so this year, um, first weekend in June every year, so it'll be the tenth time we played hockey. So, um, and we've had 50, 50 odd people come and play. Some of the girls come to play, um, all different age groups and, and generations, and we get them all back together and raise some money and, and have some fun. And it's a shame we do it, but I think it's really, really important to hmm. to do that and to recognise, you know, uh, you know, recognise things that are important. Mm. And it feels like um, that was, you know, one of um, a number of things, along with your own experience of of fatherhood that's kind of led you to what it is that you do now um, and the work that you do. So do you want to talk a bit about inspiring dads and 
and you know your philosophy and who you work with really interested in that yeah so I, in, in terms of philosophy then it's around actually it's it's difficult becoming a dad and it's a but it's also this massive opportunity to reframe and have conversations with yourself about what's important but as an individual but also conversations within your, you know, within your relationships and you know i really enjoy working with dads who are maybe it's the second time around they're a, they're a dad for the second time and how are they seeing things differently and and each time you become a parent it's almost an opportunity to check in say okay what 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 are we here for what, what am i here for as an individual what am i here for within my relationship so um and i think it all goes back to this creating a space for men to sort of talk and um, i'm quite fortunate as i work with men who whose businesses often uh, are supporting them with you know generous shared parental leave or or well-paid parental leave that they can take um and that they can take extended periods of time off in the way that i did but i wasn't paid but they're they you know they may say you know i'm working with someone at the moment we'll be going away in june and he he'll take six months off and so we're supporters the business is supporting him with coaching so a lot of what I do is around the one-to-one -one group coaching around new dads that transition we call it first year fathers it's that that time from you know before you become a dad and then afterwards and actually it's to do with the transitioning back into you know two of you working potentially and then the logistics around that so supporting them around that period of time I love working in groups when we have especially when we have dads who are maybe they're a new dad, but it's their third child, and we've got other men in that same that same cohort for whom it's the first time, and they they don't really know what to expect, and they're learning from each other, and they're getting perspectives, and they're getting they're thinking about the almost the philosophy of fatherhood. I don't ever really go into the detail of okay, well, how do you change a nappy? Other people do that, um, and I can refer people in that resource. But sort of you know, as a, as an individual, who you, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? And what do you want to have? You know, what's your what's your direction of travel? What kind of conversations are you having with your partner? Often the answer is not that many. There are we tend to there's lots of research that suggests in sort of heterosexual relationships where initially, you know, equality, gender equality might be pretty even before children come along. But because of how leave is structured, especially when men a man might only have a couple of weeks of statutory paternity leave. And a woman might have six months or you've got income differentials anyway built in more you know it's getting it's getting much, you know, much more likely now to be um to be you know for a female partner to earn more than her male partner but it still tends to be the other way around so what kind of conversations do we need to have so supporting men to do that i think is really important um for men themselves but also i'm a big advocate in that you support new dads because it's a route to gender equality at home and also at work and if we could if you can't if your business is set up in a way that flexible working is genuinely for everyone and you don't need to ask it's just something you do you degender that it doesn't become a perk for mums flexible working which i think you know pre-pandemic was certainly the case and um, part-time work is for everyone um if you can't tell who's going to take extended parental leave you know, but, you know then you can't discriminate against women who may or may not have children you can't have that overlay and so you create gender you create a much more gender neutral um, environment and culture within the workplace but also that spills into dom domestic activity men who take leave and they take extended periods of leave on their own and they look after their children and they they learn about the second shift and they learn probably almost more crucially about the mental load and all those thought processes about being a project manager for your family and when they've got that they they come back to work with entirely different views about um about you know, what's important and and what equality looks like and feels like certainly in gender equality and so it's transformational not every man of course is going to be able to take it or want to take it it takes in some ways it takes a special type of man to kind of go actually i'm going to take six months of leave and uh you have a phrase for your special kinds of men. <laughs> well, it's not my phrase, but I do like to find it about. So, um, yeah, there's a lady called Dr. Jasmine Kelland, uh, and she is a researcher and a lecturer at the University of Plymouth. And I think it might be her PhD research, actually. Um, she looked at what were the characteristics of men who took extended periods of leave versus men who didn't take extended periods of leave. 
the idea being that if you could understand why why men and some men did and some men didn't, maybe you could design policy interventions that would support men being able to do that or support kind of cultural change. Um, but what she actually found was that well, there's two there's two phrases and the first the one that she's using at the moment which I saw a couple of weeks ago was around cavalier carers the ones who are cavalier about their you know cavalier about what they're doing but the original version of that was the fuck it fathers they they were men who didn't care what other people thought they didn't care about the sort of societal um, kind of construct about what what a good man is and it's providing and actually they didn't need to be like that they wanted to do something different they didn't care whether necessarily whether they were going to miss out on opportunities at work because this was something that was important. I mean, often built on really good communication within relationships and a really a really strong sense of fairness and equity within relationships. And also, in many cases, numbers have got to work. You know, the, the best will in the world, you can have the, the bigger, you, know, you have an enormous desire to look after your children. But as a, if in your relationship, the numbers and the, and the funding for that don't, doesn't exist, then actually you push people in a different directions. So you can be as, as confident and cavalier as you like. If the numbers don't work, then I think it becomes quite challenging. One of the things I wrote down when you were uh, talking was around, you know, what does it mean to be a man and how do you think that's changing or is it changing or are people's perceptions changing? I think it's becoming more nuanced. I think... I think it's always been, I think it's always been there that there are different angles. Um, but I think it's become, as more and more men take leave or more and more men talk about being hands on dad or you have role models. I mean, we go back, we go back to sort of David Beckham sort of 20 years ago when he was sort of held up as this wonderful kind of man. And there is something slightly uncomfortable about putting fatherhood on a pedestal in a way that we wouldn't put mums on a pedestal. It's like, stuff that dads do, yeah, we eulogise it, but we eulogise it for a reason. And I certainly have sort of written about it before, because we need we need men in positions of authority or status to do things that other men think, actually, it's okay because it's okay to wear a sarong. I mean, the sarong example is slightly different, but David Beckham was, was certainly for a while held up as a very hands-on dad. I think he probably almost certainly was. We've still got a long way to go because, you know, it wasn't so long ago that Daniel Craig were, had his had his child in a uh, in, in a sling, and that was that was sort of in some areas of media was sort of slated as you know as double O papoose or something, and he was no longer this kind of superhero. It's like, well, he is. There are just different versions. I think in some ways, the more leave we have, and the more structures, and the more conversations we have, it the more it becomes okay for men to go. Actually, authentically, me is to be a carer mm. and a breadwinner. We have this, you know, I, I've read research that suggests, you know, this idea of bread, uh, breadwinning and bread sharing, and that it's not necessarily anything to do with the dynamics and relationship. It's to do with men, kind of. That's what they believe in. And I think, you know, there are there are obviously there are areas of society where men don't have agency and they don't have the opportunity to be authentically themselves. And it takes a lot of it can take a lot of courage to step outside those societal norms about you know, masculinity being about, you know, being about stoicism and, and physical strength and providing. And that's, I think it is important that that still exists and doesn't get sort of completely um, ignored. I think there are, you know, there's there's thousands of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that kind of point that actually that's that's important to identity. So I think it can be a blend. I think if we, we think about it as a blend and and therefore you've got opportunities for people to be sort of be whoever they want to be and and, and to organize their lives in mm -hmm. a way that makes sense and often we need government to do do things differently you know, yeah. shared parental leave being a great example before shared parental leave there wasn't much um, sharing of extended leave it's very very flawed and the mechanism and it's challenging but it has it has um it does kind of indicate a direction of travel which uh, then allows people to be you know to be more authentic and you know Dads in, in in group coaching with me, we we explore the idea, we explore what our fatherhood and our parenting role models were, and what did we like about that, what didn't we like about that. The fathers who were making up for it at the weekend, but weren't around during the week, and you know, and they were they were like, well, I don't want to do just a weekend father. That's what I take away from that. And you know, the dynamics pandemic for certainly for office staff was 
changed what is seen as possible. And probably finding they enjoyed it more than they thought they would, you know, that being around the family a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, um, Fatherhood Institute did a, did a piece of research, um, Fathers in Lockdown, I think it's called, and they found that 65% of men uh, reported increased, I, I can't remember the exact wording, increased connection with their, um, you know, with their children. Uh, so I think that's, uh, I think that's um, really, really good. Obviously, I, I, there's another 35%, some of whom uh, actually, it, it wasn't great, you know, being close and being connected with the children actually went the other way and some for whom it was fairly neutral, but certainly well over half of all men reporting better sort of father-child relationships as a result of being 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 more present in, in many ways, which certainly you know, not everyone had the opportunity to, but for office-based staff. Um, where where are you going next? Where do you, what's your vision? What's What's on your plans? What's your dream for inspiring dads? <laughs> well, 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 my wife is already thinking about what do we do when we're retired <laughs> and the kids aren't all around. I haven't really thought about it yet. I, I guess um, sometimes it's quite useful to think, okay, well, if you won, if you won the lottery and you want a significant amount of money, what would you do? So I know Lisa would stop work and that's her. I would actually put more money into inspiring dads and more money into, into kind of broadening out the mission. So at the moment, it's supporting new dads at work is still relatively niche and relatively um, on the front of a crest of a wave. You know, there aren't, there still isn't that, there still aren't that many men taking extended leave who, for whom businesses see that there's a need to be coached. Um, so it's for, for me, it's building a, a more consistent, bigger business model around that core kind of coaching and workshop model which then allows you to say, actually, now I want to do more th interesting things. I want to help people. I want to put something back. I want to help, um, you know, help businesses that or organizations who are working with less advantaged individuals. Um, so, you know, Future Men are a really good, you know, really good organization that I've sort of done a little bit of work with. I really like Music Football Fatherhood as well. Um, having conversations with individuals where, um, it's important to kind of reach those hard, I think it reach those harder to harder to reach areas where men men are struggling on quite basic, you know, if you think about sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're quite basic kind of needs that need to be met and and how difficult that is for those individuals. That only happens when there's enough work consistently coming in for inspiring dads to be then able to say, okay, that's running mm. itself. Let's uh, let's do things that are more interesting. I still, you know, I support to wish uh sort of financially in terms of um, a degree of a degree of money because I think that's important for uh, to sort of do that as a kind of corporate thing so I guess yeah more coaching more consistent amounts of coaching spreading the word I guess that's a big big part of this yeah. and a big part of sort of talking to you today is spreading the word about you know you support new dads you improve gender equality often that's um that's often a bigger and more important and more pressing prize for a lot of organizations so from my perspective, it's about shining a light on that and saying, actually, that one of the levers to gender equality at home and at work is to catch men when they first become dads, give them the opportunity to to share care, to share leave, and, uh, and good yeah. things will flow from yeah, there. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And what about um, advice for your younger self? What might that be? The younger younger self. Yeah, I thought about this. So. I, I went for a phase, I went for a phase in life of not thinking I was particularly ambitious. And I think, so the advice to the younger self is, the reason why I didn't feel ambitious, I guess, was because I hadn't yet found my kind of reason. It's a bit cheesy, I found, found my calling. I hadn't really found what, what mattered. I, I, I remember doing, uh, being, you know, when I first started doing coach training back in 2015 and realizing, I had an epiphany, that I realized that, I was looking at LinkedIn and I was comparing what I was doing, where I was in life versus a relatively small number of individuals for whom had high status roles. Now, I also subsequently know that those high status roles obviously came with came with a lot of baggage, but my version of success was quite narrow. So I think the advice to advice to um, younger self was go through the process, enjoy the journey. And the version of success will become mm. apparent in time. And you don't need to force it because actually the people who started off as looking like they had it all together 
later on that wasn't as clear and needed to do something different and needed to do and your time yeah I guess younger self your time will come where it'll all make mm. sense it'll all fall into yeah. place yeah I love that and final question strap line mm. for your story yeah so I think that challenge I, I thought about it I think challenging the assumptions of fatherhood so I think for dad, there were challenges around, you know, there were assumptions around fatherhood. Um, for me, as a sort of much more hands-on dad, having the opportunity to do that, that's a different, that's different from, from the norm, I guess. And and as men, I think we challenge those, challenge those societal norms or challenge how we were brought up. I think that that kind of goes a long way to kind of becoming more authentic. So yeah, I'd say challenging the assumptions of fatherhood. I think it's it can be whatever you whatever you want it to be, whatever you need it to be. Sometimes we don't always have a choice, but there's always some degree of deliberate design we can incorporate. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you so much, Ian. I've really enjoyed our conversation and it's been uh, really educational for me um, as well as interesting. So thanks very much for your time. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I was really keen to talk to Ian. I reached out to him, even though I don't know him, on social media because I 100% agree with him with his assertion that one of the routes to gender equality for women is through supporting dads to take a more active role in the care of their children. And I found the conversation absolutely fascinating and full of real nuggets and pieces of advice and I hope that you found them as equally useful as I did. One thing that I hadn't really thought about or anticipated was about how disruptive and groundbreaking, you know, pioneers, some of the, the men who I know, um, who have taken a more active and non-traditional role in the upbringing of their children. And I really loved the idea of these cavalier carers or fuck it fathers, as he and Dr. Jasmine Kelland are referring to them. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Secret Resume. If you did, remember to like, share, comment and subscribe as that helps people like you find people like us.